Welcome back to our deep dive series. In this episode, we are going to go down a rabbit hole that I stumbled upon while browsing the RBI subreddit. But before we dive in, I would like to thank our channel members for their continuous support, as well as our regular subscribers. I am finally finished with my move and very excited to get back into the rhythm of things. If you'd like to support the channel, you can leave a like and subscribe, or consider becoming a channel member. But enough of that. Now that that's out the way, let's dive in. It all started when I came across a post titled, Global con man Ryan Roth is still on the run after scamming around 12 million and leaving a fake side note in Bali in 2020. As we dive deeper, we will mention the topic of, in YouTube terms, unaliving oneself. But as you will see, it's not about the act itself, but more about how this individual has used the threat of the act to conduct various amounts of scams. By no means am I stating that I know what this person's mind space is or was, nor am I attempting to discredit any real issues they or anyone else might have. Nonetheless, if that is something that you are not comfortable with, I understand. The original Reddit post I saw was posted on April 5th, 2024, by a user who went by the name Ryan's Uncle. The Reddit post contained multiple article links from all over the world, and it read like this. In 2020, a note was left at the top of a cliff in Bali. The story went around the world. This last scam happened just before COVID and lockdown, so everyone was wearing masks, and it was very difficult to identify people moving around. Since his second fake note in Bali 2020, I've uncovered scams of his over the years totaling around 12 million. A documentary on his life and scams is due shortly on Discovery Plus, called The Faking Dead. It tells all about Ryan's scams and lies. I flew over to Bali and proved that the note was fake. I also found the flight ticket Ryan had booked out of Bali on the day his things were discovered on the cliff top. He also has four passports in different names. Prior to the documentary, I decided to tell my own story and post it on YouTube. It tells all the things not in the documentary due to time constraints and the fact that there's so much to tell. My video is homemade, and it's just me telling all the information about his scams and stories from others that have contacted me. He sets up companies that help good causes and then vanishes. Some of his companies include Kabu & Co, Malala Coffee, Roth Management, White Orchid, New Filmmakers of LA, Living Legends, Noble Remix, etc, etc, etc. Please help me track him down. Latest reports are that he's in Gifu, Japan. The first article was from the Daily Mail UK, and it describes the incident in Bali. See, Ryan's things, like the OP said, were found on a cliff in the Pakatu village. This included a bottle of alcohol, his motorcycle helmet, and a letter addressed to his then-girlfriend, Alice Yu. The letter went like this. I'm sorry, Alice. I'm the man you fell in love with, but past things I never did. Maybe you feel I was a stranger. I'll always love you. None of this is your fault. Your old man, XX. When these items were discovered, the local authorities began a search effort and sent out a team to look for Ryan in the area where his things were found. Unfortunately, the cliffs that everybody assumed Ryan had jumped from were 500 feet above sea level and at the bottom was very rough brush, which made the search extremely difficult. And despite the team's efforts, no trace of Ryan was discovered. But interestingly enough, on January 23rd of 2020, one day after the original Daily Mail article was published, the Daily Mail would post a second article. But this time it was titled, Did the Briton missing in Bali fake his own death? Entrepreneur who left a note at a cliff beauty spot is wanted over fraud claims in Australia and is accused of scams around the world. In this article, the Daily Mail revealed that Ryan Roth's real name could actually be Ryan Flynn, and he has been known to scam people from all over the world, including the United States, France, and Australia. His scams range from selling an elderly woman a penny for $8,100 to even starting fake charities and running off with the donations. Scammers like this are everywhere, and in the age of the internet, you really never know who is trying to take advantage of you. But that's why I use Aura. Hey guys, did you know that data brokers are out there selling your information to spammers, scammers, and anybody else who might want to target you? This includes your name, your home and email address, your health records, your relatives, it's all out there. 
but that's why I'm happy to be using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. When I first signed up, I was surprised to see just how many data brokers were out there selling my information. For me, making sure that my personal information is well protected is something that I took really seriously. But thankfully, Aura shows me which data brokers are selling the information and begins to submit opt-out requests for me. And this really helps because cleaning up my personal information not only reduces the amount of spam calls and emails that I get, but it also protects me from hackers who might want to access my social media accounts, my bank accounts, or any other sensitive information. Aura also does a lot more to protect me and my family from online threats that I can't see. I get other features like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set up, and best of all, you get it all at one affordable price. You may already have one or two of these tools already, but not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Aura is always on doing the hard work of protecting me so that I can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. I value my privacy, and I value yours too. So go to Aura.com slash Colt Coffin for your two-week free trial. It's risk-free, it really helps support the channel, and best of all, it helps get you started on protecting your information. So once again, that's Aura.com slash Colt Coffin. The link will be provided in the description. And now, back to the video. Our OP linked many more articles from all over, each telling a version of Ryan's story, but the post itself finishes off like this. It was then discovered that over 5 million had vanished from Kabu, 1 million from Malala Coffee, and half a million from White Orchid, a charity set up to stop child sex trafficking, plus many other companies. Do you think he jumped? If so, why? The search and rescue team in Bali said it was fake. Everyone I've spoken to said it was fake. And what happened to his phone? It was not left at the scene with his passport. A previous note was left in Thailand before he skipped with money from Malala Coffee. Australia police have an active warrant out for his arrest for scams in Australia. There are too many scams and stories from friends who knew him to tell here. So check out the video on YouTube, Ryan Roth, Dead Fake. As ROP stated, they provided their own video on YouTube where they go over Ryan's history of scams. And as it turns out, ROP, Ryan's uncle, was in fact Ryan's uncle. His name is Sean Flynn. Needless to say, after finishing the post, reading the articles and watching Sean's video, I wanted to know more. So, I reached out to him. In our interactions, Sean told me more about the documentary he filmed with Discovery Plus, where they flew him out to visit the places Ryan had scammed people in. This included Bali, where Sean even took it upon himself to dive into the ocean and look for Ryan's possible remains himself. Sean was gracious enough to send me pictures from the dive, as well as copies of all of the information that he's gathered from his personal experiences, experiences with his family, as well as others who have reached out to Sean in his over a decade long hunt for his nephew. We will be going over the timeline, focusing on major events, but Sean's video will of course be linked in the description if you would like to watch the whole thing for yourself. As we get into our timeline, I will state that a lot of this information is information that I received from Sean, as well as what I was able to piece together from various articles and websites. Sean has provided documentation to help validate some of these claims, but as of right now, Ryan has not been convicted for any of these things, so I have to say that this is all alleged from various first and second hand accounts. I will simply be going over the information and allow you to formulate your own opinion on this individual. But from the looks of it, Ryan's first scam was in 1999, when he was around 19 years old, and his first victim was his very own grandmother who he convinced to lend him money, promising to pay her back after he launched the London charity event, but that never materialized. This pattern would continue for quite some time, where Ryan would ask his non for money to help him start up a business. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, and we'll get back to that later on. Back to the early 2000s, Ryan would become a drug dealer where he eventually consumed a little bit too much of his own product. This would result in him being hospitalized and put on a psychiatric hold, but he would take this as an opportunity to escape with a friend and relocate to Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, Ryan lived rent-free, couch hopping and conducting apartment scams. This is also where Ryan begins his acting career, which he claims was successful. 
In fact, in a book Ryan was featured in, he states that he got 90% of the roles he auditioned for. But because he was not on the correct type of visa, he could not legally work on these roles, to which I could understand. But you would think as a young entrepreneur with several businesses, that you would be able to set up a visa so that you could get work in the US, especially if you were landing 90% of the roles you auditioned for. Ryan would stay in California until 2007, but it appears as though he was always flying around the world. One Redditor, who posted on the Unsolved Mysteries subreddit, would post about Ryan and share their experience meeting him during this time. This is an old story, but I think it's a good one as this guy conned several people out of money, including his own grandmother and mother. I also actually met this guy once and have heard all sorts of horror stories, so I would love to see him caught. I haven't seen anything new posted about him for ages, so I'm hoping this may stoke up some interest. So I met this guy in Thailand in 2007. It was clear that Ryan desperately wanted to be rich and respected. However, he was a very lazy guy and seemed to hope that if he just chilled out all day every day, the billions in respect would start rolling in. My business was going well at the time I met him, so he clung on to me in the hope that I could help his business get up and running. I'm happy to help others to an extent, and I said to Ryan that he could use our rented workspace. Ryan showed up, helped himself to a drink, and just sat around for 30 minutes. Then, he kept trying to get me to play table tennis with him, and kept interrupting me with his banal chat, which involved some quite disgusting jokes involving the sexualization of women. He was 27 at the time, and I thought he seemed really immature. I was working 100 hours plus per week at the time, and I really had no time for him, so I told him not to come back. However, this did not stop him trying to get into business with me, as he would send me dozens, literally dozens of business ideas from him. I once even got three emails from him in a day with different ideas. One of his ideas was to start up a business where investors would invest in people. For example, if they invested 100,000 in a person to help them through university, then the investor gets 10% of that person's future earnings. I actually replied to that one to say, Ryan, do you realize you can't trade human beings? That's slavery. And he responded to say that his lawyers had said it was fine. I also received word that he was couch surfing and staying in a different place each week to presumably save on rent. He did ask if he could crash at my place whilst he finalized the new rental contract, but I just ignored it. He would talk like he was a rich businessman, but he seemed to be living hand to mouth. He then got involved in a charity to help save young girls from the sex trafficking industry. A noble cause for sure, except it was clear the whole thing was a scam. The donations page even had a PayPal link to his own Gmail account. I also found it ironic that Ryan should suddenly care about women's welfare when he seemed to refer to them as objects. Around this time, he complained to me that people had given him the nickname Rambo Ryan because of his heroics of extracting female victims by force. He acted annoyed saying he didn't want to be seen as a hero, which was hilarious as the only person I had ever heard refer to him as Rambo Ryan was himself. He was basically complaining about the nickname in order to make it sick. It's hilarious today to think that he tried to portray himself as a hero to everyone, but pretty much everyone who knew him back then knows he's a con man. I had built up quite a dislike for Ryan and went so far to email the associates who worked with him on his charity. To avoid a direct accusation, I told them charity scams were on the rise. Whether they were or not, I don't know. I just wanted an excuse to email them and that they should comprehensively check who they were working with I got an irate email back from one of the people saying that yes, the charity was struggling to get going, but negative people like me really were helping. So what could I do? There was also a period of time when Ryan inexplicably just started referring to himself as Dr. Ryan Roth. Presumably the doctor tag made him seem more trustworthy. I know he is not a doctor as when I met him, he said he was yet to complete his degree and I was not aware that he had completed it. He has scammed so many people over the years and I was just waiting for him to get caught. There were rumors when I knew him that he had scammed his own grandmother out of her life savings. I thought it was bullshit as even Ryan wouldn't sink that low. But wow, he did as confirmed in the article. The frustrating thing is that he's still on the run 15 years later. However, I do take comfort that his own family, friends, ex-lovers and business associates know what a rat he is. When the story about his fake to death broke, there were so many emails from old faces and pretty much everyone acknowledged that they knew he was shifty. He scammed some people out of 50,000, and that is just the people I know about. 
The trail seems to have gone cold, but I hope one day you will get caught. This is a lengthy post, but I just wanted to share my experience. And this Redditor was not the only one. My regular web search for Ryan never disappoints. Nice to hear some stories about this guy. Here's mine. Ryan dated my friend for a few weeks, but they split up after my friend found out about his unhealthy obsession. After the split, Ryan embarked on a bizarre emotional manipulation spree. On a night out, he told me to tell my friend that he was thinking about her a lot, and in the middle of the night, he texted me to ask if I had passed on the message. A week later, he turned up at a bar where we were, and weirdly started to act all distressed, literally had his head in his hands and shaking his head. It was all a game, and he was just trying to make my friend feel bad. But she didn't feel bad. She just laughed. We all laughed at him, really. We frequently took the piss out of him for years after he moved away. Another time, he spoke to me about how much he loved my friend. Then, only moments later, he tried chatting me up by saying my boyfriend was lucky to have me. Then, minutes later, he asked me if I had any single friends. This was literally 20 minutes of conversation. He started off expressing his love for my friend, then chatted me up, then asked me to hook him up. Well, I'm so sorry, Ryan, that I could not get a woman for you to massage your ego and give you the attention you crave. The note he left on the cliff for his girlfriend was also manipulative, trying to make her feel bad for all the shit he did. It really does not surprise me that all his fraud targets are women. To think of the pain he put his mom through as well. Another time he answered his phone and said, Who's this? I'm Jonathan. No, Ryan. It's Ryan. Did he forget his own name? LOL. Shifty as fuck. Thanks for sharing your experience. It's funny, since he defrauded my sister in Australia, I'd regularly Google his name, connecting with others who were scammed by him, hoping he'd finally get busted. After many years, it slowed down. And then when this story finally broke last year, I felt like I had finally got some form of closure, as the world had finally seen the fraud he was after a decade. Which brings us to Australia, around the time frame of 2007 and 2008, where one of his most infamous scams took place. This would be when Ryan convinced an elderly woman into buying a penny from 1970 for $8,100, emptying her life savings. The woman collected vintage coins and Ryan saw this as an opportunity to make a quick buck. After this, he fled Australia, wanted for questioning by the police. This is also where Ryan started the White Orchid charity. Like our previous OP had informed us, this charity's aim was to help rescue victims of child trafficking and Ryan managed to sell the idea so well that he accumulated around 500,000 in donations. Once back in LA, LAPD wanted to speak to Ryan because of a large number of credit cards and information from multiple PayPal accounts that were found in one of the apartments he was scamming. But for some reason, they did not arrest him. Soon after, he would meet Karen Beck, also known as DJ Shy, who at first did not like Ryan, since she knew he was doing scams. But after Ryan faked another attempt at harming himself, Karen felt that she could help him. And so, a relationship between them would start. Fast forward a couple of years to November 2009, Ryan starts Roth Management, a talent agency where he tells aspiring actors and comedians that he can get them roles and publicity. But all of this is a lie. Remember, Ryan can't legally work in the US, and so this company cannot legally operate either. It's also around this time that Ryan manages to land an appearance on A Thousand Ways to Die, as well as some other shows. But one appearance in particular happened on YouTube for a channel called The American Pranksters. The video is still up today and features Ryan playing a cockroach prank on Karen. From the looks of it, Ryan was trying everything and anything to make it. But little did he know, he was just leaving a trail of crumbs for all the scams that he's committed. Ryan did manage to stay in LA until 2012, but Ryan had not paid the taxes on any of the businesses he was operating, or his grandma for that matter, but unfortunately, unlike his grandma, the IRS were not going to simply let this slide. This forced Ryan to break up with Karen and flee the US. But he did have a plan. See, towards the end of his relationship with Karen, he had already started talking to a Japanese model by the name Yuki Matsumura. Once he fled LA, Ryan ended up in Japan and moved in rent-free with Yuki, who was now his girlfriend. Are we beginning to see a pattern here? In Japan, Ryan rebranded Roth Management 
from acting to art and ended up signing a well-known artist named Min Jae Lee. This was Ryan's ticket into the art world, where he would scam investors into giving him money by claiming he owned an art gallery. In fact, his art scams led to the creation of this webpage. On the Thinglish Lifestyle webpage, the author Perry tells us about their experience with Ryan and a piece of artwork that they tried to purchase from him. This page is titled, Where Art Thou, Kate? Back in 2014, I made a rash decision to invest in an original artwork called Kate by Korean artist Min Jae Lee, who also goes by the alias Greno MJ. The Kate in question is Kate Moss, an English model born in Croydon, Greater London. Here's my story of the last seven years with and without Kate that took a bizarre twist when art dealer Ryan Roth faked his own death in Bali. It all started in October 2013, when a friend from London now living and working in LA arrived in Bangkok. Kate, my wife and I, joined him and some other friends he was traveling with for dinner on two consecutive evenings before they all headed over to a film premiere in Vietnam. One of the dinner guests turned out to be another guy from the UK, Southampton to be precise, who went by the name Ryan Roth. As it turns out, he was also known as Ryan Flynn. I found out later, he met my friend in LA at a Brits in Hollywood breakfast. He didn't know him that well at all. He was just orbiting his network. Ryan befriended me, and we met up maybe a half dozen times with others for drinks and dinner over the next couple of months. I only recall going out once together to a Japanese restaurant in Bangkok because he was over eager to school me on his knowledge of sushi. I remember it only because the restaurant had porn magazines laying around it, and he started telling me stories of his escapades with the ladies. I marked him down as another sex pest in Asia. Around this time, I was looking to move funds out of a company I had in the UK, before closing it down to offset my tax liabilities. After all, tax is theft. If you can legally avoid it, you have a duty to yourself to hang on to your own hard-earned dosh. Ryan had spoken about his company Roth Management, and the artist he represented. Not knowing anything about the art world, I thought it would be a good idea to invest in an original piece. And so, I purchased Kate 2008, acrylic on canvas, for $10,000. What a fool was I. Perry explains that he had planned to hold on to the Kate art piece for a year and sell it hoping to reinvest the money. But actually selling the art piece would prove to be difficult. Initially, after his purchase of $10,000, Perry was informed that the painting was located in LA. It was in the possession of a DJ and their wife. From what I've gathered, they were supposed to aid in the sale of the Kate painting alongside Roth management. But this is where things began to get dodgy. Ryan, who was constantly contacting Perry in the beginning, trying to convince him to join in on various amounts of money-making schemes, was now silent, seemingly ignoring Perry's messages about the painting. And the couple who possessed the painting did not seem to be helping either, leaving Perry frustrated and starting to believe that there may not even be a painting after all. Eventually, after failing to sell the painting, responsibility of the art piece shifted from the DJ to their wife, who actually owned a legitimate art gallery in LA. But this had already been too stressful for Perry, who ended up contacting the people in possession of the art with some damning evidence about Ryan. I sent her an email with a link to the Daily Mail online and a simple message. Do you know about this? It turns out that Ryan Roth was wanted for serial fraud in Australia and other countries. He made headlines around the world for either committing suicide or faking his own death in Bali. Of course, true to form, I received no reply from Kay, so I followed up a day later with another email. Just reading this email thread dating back to the start of January 2016, I must say if I was unresponsive to clients' valid questions and queries, I'd be out of business. I find your lack of communication extremely unprofessional. With the current situation coming to light of Ryan Roth being a serial scammer and confirming my thoughts about him, I wonder where that leaves Kate and you in the story. Are you an unwitting victim or accomplice? Does Kate even exist? Here's what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. You need to prove you have possession of the artwork of Kate by Min Jae Lee. Email me a photo of the artwork with today's cover of the LA Times so I can clearly see the date and headline. If you have sold the artwork, your suggested price was $16,000. You need to provide a receipt and payment to me minus your 20% commission. If Kate exists, you haven't sold it, and it's in your possession, let's arrange immediate, secure, and ensure delivery to my home address in Thailand. Failure to respond fully as outlined above, 
or not at all will leave me with the only option to contact the press who are already looking for stories about Ryan Roth. I'll let a journalist uncover the connections between you, Gary, and Ryan. This is not my preferred option, but this whole experience with Ryan and you and your gallery has been nothing short of shady and very stressful for me. The ball is in your court. What happens next is up to you. Hopefully, it can be a positive outcome for us both, so we can move on. Looking forward to hearing from you. Well, that did the trick. A day later, I received a response. As stated at several points, we have had no interest in someone wanting to buy this piece. And, as also stated, I am happy to have the piece professionally packed ready for you to be picked up by a shipper of your choice. Ryan Roth is of no affiliation to me or the gallery. Please let me know if you would like the piece packaged for shipment and I will send along details of the package so you can liaise with your shipper. Luckily, after this interaction, it seems as though Perry was finally able to get in possession of the piece of art. And thankfully for him, it was in fact real. Though shipping it to Thailand ended up costing another 8,000. As an outsider, it looks like Ryan was able to broker this deal and, as soon as he had gotten Perry's initial payment from the sale, Ryan left Perry to deal with everything else on his own, rather than managing the art sale, like it says in the name of his company, Roth Management. But at least Perry was able to get the art piece despite having to jump through all of these hurdles. Today, the piece is available for purchase as an NFT, and the purchaser will also receive the physical copy as well. But all of the trouble that Perry had to go through in order to get the painting that he owned is just another example of one of Ryan's schemes. Now, as I said earlier, throughout all of this time, Ryan was still collecting money from his grandma and would ultimately end up pocketing around 18,000 British pounds, which converts to a little over 22,000 US dollars. This was practically his grandmother's life savings. But it wasn't until 2013 that she finally started asking Ryan to pay her back. And finally, in June of 2013, around 14 years after he first asked her for money, he finally sent her 50 pounds, or around 63 American dollars. By July of 2015, he would have paid her a total of 350 British pounds out of the 18,000 that he owed his grandmother. That's only about $442 out of the 22,000 that he owed her. Sean would provide logs of the Facebook messages between Ryan and his grandmother of them discussing the owed payment. Messages that went like, What happened to the parcel you sent? And any money would help me that you promised to send or put in my bank. Hope you are well. Love, Nan. Parcel is being sent. We'll try to send some money next month. Ryan, did you put money in my bank as I can't see it on my statement? Hope backs better, Nan. Hi, Nan. It's been a very tough few months. I should be able to put some in in the next seven days. Please remind me, and I'm sorry for the delay. I appreciate you not constantly reminding me, as it would have stressed me out, trying to do my best. Okay, thanks. I would not ask, but things are tight. Things are always tight, as I owe you a lot of money. Ryan then sends a payment confirmation for the first payment of 50 pounds that he sent his grandma in June of 2013. More messages from July 2014. These messages in particular happened after Ryan's mother, Sean's sister, passed away. Ryan, when you say soon you will get money, do you mean this week or next month so I can expect to order the items I desperately need? Nan, when I have it, you can have it. I literally don't have it right now. I can't change that until it changes, so I hope it's soon. Do you think you will be paying me this year, as I am getting desperate? Yes. Any idea when? Nan, I don't know how to explain to you anymore. When I have it, I will send it. Thailand visa rules just changed, so I could be in a very bad situation in the next two weeks. I understand that you need it, and understand I will send it when I can. If I predict when, and it doesn't happen, what do I do then? You're asking me to lie to you, to tell you things which are certain, and as I can't do that, what do you want me to do? Would you like me to lie to you? Also, I get the impression here that Sean is looking at me, looking at me online, etc. The internet tells you things about who is looking at you. So if Sean is trying to do something here, not sure what exactly, but I do know 100% he's looking at me. Best for him to stop that now. He's nothing to me. 
and I'm nothing to him. Do you think Sean has better things to do? He has not been looking at you online. He said why would he, so don't spout rubbish to me. I have to have a counseling, so I don't need this. If you're so clever to get online to Sean, don't involve me. Don't you think I have enough getting through each day, unless you have forgotten I lost my daughter? And there were many, many more messages as well. Most of which just feature Nan asking Ryan for the payment she is owed, and him giving her the usual runaround, occasionally sending her pennies compared to what he owes her. Meanwhile, he's posting, living it up, and bragging about how successful his business ventures are to his friends online. It is also here that we truly begin to see Ryan's resentment for Sean because of Sean's concerns over Ryan owing Nan money. Sean would also provide us with a copy of the money transfer from Nan to Ryan in 2007. This will be important down the line. Going back to our timeline, in June of 2014, when Ryan's mother passed away, it is according to Sean himself who was at the funeral that initially, Ryan claimed to have no money to fly back to the UK so that he could say goodbye to his mother. This delayed the funeral, and when Ryan did show up, he was instructed to wait until the whole family got to his mother's house before showing up. Unfortunately, when Sean and the rest of the family got home, Ryan was already going through his mother's things, looking at documents and seemingly searching for any form of money. Ryan goes back to Japan, and Nan gets more serious about the money that Ryan owes her. This seemed to be the last straw for Ryan, because after this, he threatened to cut off all communication with his grandmother and the rest of the family. He also sent out an email to his grandmother, Sean, and the Cyprus police, denying that he had stolen anything from them, and even denying that Nan had lent him any money at all. This was because he knew that most of the transactions were done in cash, and could not be easily proven other than the messages that he exchanged with his grandmother on Facebook as well as the copy from the money transfer that Sean provided. But sadly, it would appear that Nan would never get to see any of that money that she was owed, because she would pass away shortly after. It was while clearing her things that Sean had found a handwritten letter addressed to Ryan from his grandmother. I'll let him read it to you. I came across a letter that she had written to Ryan, which was in a box. She didn't know where to put it. I'm going to read out the whole letter. Some of you may have seen the letter already that I uh, sent onto the Daily Mail in the UK. Thanks very much, Ryan, for letting me down. I have no money left now. I'm worrying for the first time in 70 years. I've had no stress and you have put paid to that. I trusted you and thought that you of all people would not let me down. It goes to show I was wrong. I will never trust anyone again. Took me hours to get you the 3,000 from the bank that I sent you on the Western Union transfer. Yet six weeks later, you've not given me any money. And all the money that you owe me, nearly 18,000 pound. And for the first time in your mother's life, she had a few bob behind her just in case she was ill and you robbed her of that. So I mentioned before when my mother sold the house, she had some money left over. She had given some money to Sheena which I think was about four or five thousand, just to make things easier for her. And clearly, he even managed to steal that. You have made me ill since you took all my money. The doctor has said it's stress and worry, and it should not be happening to me at my age, but it has, and it's all through you. I lent you money left, right and centre, and not a penny back. You just kept wanting more. Sean was moving to Cyprus, and I have no money to go and see him as I am broke. You've only paid me £350 since February the 4th, 2013. I think it's about time you pay me back. Your mother had to borrow money off her boss to pay her rent. Have you no shame? To think your mother went hungry because of you. She signed it, Nan. I think this is a clear example of some of the effects that Ryan's scams have had on other people's lives. This being his very own grandmother, who Ryan refused to pay back even when she needed the money to get the help she desperately needed. Finally, in 2016, Ryan and Yuki move to Bangkok with Yuki's cat, Kabu, and Ryan starts the Malala Coffee Company under the premise that this is an ethical coffee company. 
he also begins having an affair with a woman named Pearly, whose father was the CEO of a very large hotel chain. Pearly ended up getting upset about being Ryan's second woman, so she confronted Yuki to expose Ryan. But somehow, he turns it around on Yuki, telling her he's depressed while threatening to harm himself yet again and convinces her to leave the apartment that they were sharing. He then throws all of Yuki's things outside of the apartment, including her cat Kabu, which thankfully was confirmed to have been found by Yuki's friends according to Sean. On Yuki's birthday, Ryan calls her to tell her to come back but simultaneously announces his engagement to Pearly on social media. Yuki dumps Ryan and eventually Pearly does as well after her father had informed her that she was being scammed out of their money. With both girls having left him, Malala investors demanding their money back, and Pearly's CEO father hunting Ryan down, he does what he's best at, and relocates to Bali, using the money he stole from the Malala coffee business. You can actually still find the Malala Kickstarter page, where, if you scroll down into the comments, you will see multiple people complaining about not receiving their shipments. While in Bali in 2017, Ryan starts up another coffee company. This time, he names it Kabu & Co. It's essentially the same exact scam as Malala, but this time, it's named after Yuki's cat. The same one Ryan put out on the street. He also finds a new girlfriend, Alice Yu, the one we met in the first article of the video. She began to help Ryan run Kabu & Co. until late 2019, but just like with Malala, investors began getting upset and catching on to the scam. This would also include Alice, who, according to a second-hand account, discovered that Ryan was hiding money in January of 2020, and Google searched him, only to discover his trail of scams. It was after she confronted him that he went to the cliff in Bali and left the note that blew this story up. Which brings us up to date with the story so far. And this rabbit hole goes deeper. There is even an Instagram page with the username fraudster101 that started posting as early on as January of 2020, aimed at exposing Ryan and his multiple scams. So far, we've got Instagram pages, web pages, Reddit posts, YouTube videos and podcasts, and even a documentary filmed by Discovery Plus. But no trace of Ryan anywhere. Sean did inform me that the documentary on Discovery Plus, as well as other YouTube documentaries, are currently facing some difficulties in getting their story out there due to legal issues, despite a team of lawyers informing Sean that there should be no issues releasing the documentary. But I challenge this, because the person we've spent the whole video talking about is allegedly dead, right? So if a video of this person were released, who would attempt to take it down? Who would go to court over this? Nobody. That is unless Ryan Roth, or should I say Ryan Flynn, were actually alive and actually willing to go into court to fight this. If that's the case, then I guess Ryan would have to show himself and risk getting in the eyes of the law, which I doubt he'll be doing anytime soon. Sean has tried contacting Ryan, and one of the messages that was sent to Ryan's accounts was even read after Ryan had supposedly jumped off that cliff. So either somebody has access to this account, or Ryan slipped up. As of right now, nobody knows where Ryan has gone off to, though Sean believes he may be back in Japan running his art scams, but there really is no way of knowing. Sean also believes Ryan could have possibly gotten plastic surgery to help hide his identity. With Ryan's final disappearance in Bali happening right as COVID was on the rise, Ryan did manage to get a head start using masks and the COVID pandemic to his advantage. But all of that is over, and hopping from country to country is not too easy anymore, with everybody on your tail. Of course, we are assuming that Ryan didn't pass away in Bali, this being because of his history of these lies. So I ask you this. Do you think Ryan is out there right now scamming another victim? It's stories like this that make me love Reddit so much. Because you never know just how deep the rabbit hole can get off of a single Reddit post. All we can do now is spread the word and hope that somehow justice can be brought to the victims of Ryan's scams. If you've had an experience with Ryan, you can contact Sean at info at freedomdiverscypress.com as well as on his Reddit post. Sean runs the Freedom Divers Cyprus Scuba Diving Center based in Paphos, Cyprus and specializes in helping disabled people on their first dives. So, if you would like to support Sean, show him and his diving center some love. But that is all for this video. 
As always, all of the sources as well as documentation will be provided in the description if you would like to do some digging for yourself. Leave a like if you made it this far. And as always, thanks for watching.